Neil, in dealing with science and religion, which is controversial and uh, sometimes contentious, it's often said that uh, uh, religion needs to understand science, but science in no way even needs to think that religion has any validity whatsoever. Uh, in your long studies of Buddhism and your scientific career, have you ever found anything in your meditations and your appreciation of enlightenment and Buddhism that helps your science? Yeah, <laughs> which is not what I was expecting. I didn't go into Buddhist practice thinking, oh, I'm going to be a better student or it's going to help me figure out how the cosmos works. I just sort of wanted to have a direct experience of the world that would make a little more sense than the everyday. The first thing is methodological. In uh, Zen Buddhism specifically, which is what I've studied, uh, there's something called koan practice. A koan may be something like a riddle. The most famous one is, what's the sound of one hand clapping? <laughs> this is not the answer. <laughs> Um, most of them are stories of interactions between a student and a teacher in which it may seem nonsensical what the exchange is. Uh, the student may ask the teacher something and they come back with a response that you don't understand. But out of that, the student has an awakening experience. Can you experience that yourself? You don't solve a koan with the intellect. You can try, and that's what uh, early in your practice you try. And you go into your teacher and you give them every intellectual yeah. answer, you, and they go, bring, they ring the bell and throw you out of the room. Eventually, you learn that it's about becoming the koan. You actually settle into a meditative state and just sort of hold the question. You're not trying to solve it. And kind of almost magically, the question dissolves into an understanding. And it took me a while. I didn't realize I was practicing my science that way, but that's what was starting to happen. So when I started doing stem cell research, there was a point where it stopped being about the mouse in the lab, in part because I'm a liver pathologist and I work with human tissues, and that's what interested me. But even then, it's like, well, the tissue of the person under my microscope. But my body is doing everything I was studying in the lab. So I tried to have an experience of this rather than an intellectual understanding of it. Very much, and I was conscious about this, Einstein was my hero growing up. And the first time I saw a bone marrow cell winding up as a liver cell, which wasn't supposed to happen, I didn't really know how to understand that. And I thought, well, Einstein got on the light beam. I'm going to settle up on the cell and travel to the <laughs> liver and see what happens. That opened up the question of, being the stuff I was talking about. Mm. I had a moment of crossing Park Avenue and I was thinking about my body as cells and, um, and the light changed and I couldn't move my leg to step off the curb because I had become a population of cells that were self-organizing and I didn't know how to make that move. One morning I was sitting in the Zendo. Um, I was responsible for opening up the place for uh, meditators. And I was alone that morning. And um, I was sitting at one end, and there was some incense on the altar at the other end. And I was meditating. Well, I was trying to meditate, but I was thinking about stem cells <laughs> because I couldn't turn it off, which is the nature of koan practice. It sort of gets in your system, and you can't drop it. And as I was contemplating my body as cells, I looked up at the altar, and I saw the smoke curling up from the incense. And it was as though I could see the particles of the rigid stick becoming smoke. And I suddenly had an experience, a direct experience, of my body as self-organizing cells. Me sort of dissolved the way the stick was dissolving into the smoke. And I suddenly realized, wait a second, Buddhists talk about... Um, uh, emptiness of inherent existence, which is like, what the hell is that? Oh, that's whether I experience myself as a thing or a phenomenon arising from smaller things. So suddenly the science had started to illuminate the, uh, the Buddhism, but at the same time that made me ask, well, what about the cells then? Are they empty of inherent existence too? And that led to Oh, no, they're just biomolecules that are self-assembling. So the two things started playing off of each other. 
So methodologically, the way I hold a question now is very much like I hold a koan. Um, people will ask me, um, well, what do you think about that? And if I don't have an answer, sometimes if they're being antagonistic, it's like, well, then you don't understand things. And my reply is, well, I don't understand them yet. And I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> I just hold it and let things, let things evolve. But there is a degree to which my experience of the universe through contemplative practice, it doesn't guide my science. It's not giving me the questions I'm asking either. My science comes from my science. Right. But my intuition about where the answer might be found is sometimes guided either by the philosophy or the, um, or the direct experience, more often the direct experience. Most importantly, most of my ideas, creative ideas, the kind of scientific idea I have or hypothesis where I think of it and I know that it, I haven't done the experiments yet, but I know what the result is going to be. The best ideas I've ever had came sitting on the cushion, meditating. Um, and I don't know how to define that process. I'm not present for it. But suddenly there's a new idea. The idea that cells could actually go from the circulation into different organs, um, that was an idea that came out of meditation. It didn't come out of the logic of my biology. But the moment I had it, I could design the experiments and test it. And those kind of ideas in my gut, I already know the answer, um, which is pretty cool. <laughs>